Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for session two of Biotelemetry for the Life Sciences. My name is Andy Henton and I will be your host for today's event. Our session today is sponsored by TSC Systems and is all about freedom, about enabling scientists to do more in both the tra traditional lab space and outside of the lab in unique re research environments in regards to studying animal physiology, behavior, and metabolism by the way of implantable telemetry. So at this point I'd like to introduce our guest speakers. Dr. Harmnot, or Harry as he typically goes by, studied pharmacy in the Netherlands where he worked on a whole animal model of synaptic co-transmission in an instrumented rat using the portal vein model. He completed his PhD at Novartis in Basel, Switzerland and following went to the University of Vermont to do a postdoc with Mark Nelson studying vascular tone in the brain and heart. Following, he moved into a tenure track position at the University of Florida in Gainesville where he combined confocal imaging and electrophysiology to further his studies of vascular tone regulation. Throughout his career, Harry developed novel instrumentation to enable the types of measurements he needed for his research. Today, this is his full-time passion. Currently, Harry holds the position of Chief Technology Officer at TSC Systems and is both an applications and technology expert in the area of implantable telemetry. He has published more than 45 peer-reviewed papers, some of which are among the highest individual cited by the Journal of Physiology. Our second speaker is Lou DeLacy. Dr. DeLacy is a classical professor of physiology who loves to work at the lab bench. As director for the cardiovascular and respiratory sequences for first-year medical students at the University of Michigan, he also spends a lot of time in the classroom. Lou is the director of the telemetry core facility, making available continuous conscious monitoring of blood pressure and ECG in mice and rats. His research areas of specialty are cardiovascular physiology and pathophysiology, hypoxia, ischemia, and integrative physiology. He has 135 peer-reviewed publications, many of which focus on the use of telemetry. And third is Dr. Jeffrey Osborne. Dr. Osborne is Professor and Associate Chair of Biology in the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of Kentucky. He has published over 150 journal articles, book chapters, and abstracts primarily in the area of salt and water metabolism, the neural control of renal function, and hypertension. His current research interests are focused ki kidney ex specific expression of both nuclear and mitochondrial genes in experimental models of hypertension. Most recently, the Osborne group has identified a novel model of essential hypertension in the non-human primate, specifically the vervet or African green monkey. This translational old world primate model of hypertension is the focus of today's discussion on measurements of blood pressure by telemetry in freely moving primates. So let's things, hand things over to our first speaker now, Dr. Harmnod. Well, thank you, Andy, for the introduction. Uh, what I'd like to cover in this first talk is to introduce our audience to a new next generation telemetry system called Stellar, marketed by TSC Systems. In the following two talks, you will hear a lot of practical information on the use and implementation of Stellar and how this relates to current legacy systems on the market. So in my talk, I want to introduce and focus on the special features of Stellar that we believe offer a new toolbox to a lot of existing telemetry users looking for a change but also actually opens it up to a lot of new potential users. We like to sum up these features in the word freedom, and this extends both to the animal and the researcher. Freedom of time, place, and flexibility in measurement, basically what telemetry should be. So what novelties are we talking about in Stellar? To introduce these, we can actually refer back to the last webinar, and specifically the lecture by Brian Brockway. In one of his slides, he identified continuing challenges facing telemetry that are not met by current systems on the market. Specifically, reliability, uh, the potential for electrical interference between implants, uh, such as linked to the use of analog frequencies. In Stellar, all things are digital. We use multiple frequencies and high frequency bands, also offering faster data transmission. Another challenge mentioned was smaller devices that need longer sending range and not always on because of the battery drainage. In Stellar, the battery improvements and the latest digital transmitter technology are used to meet these challenges. The third challenge was improvements on processing and data mining, basically analysis. And this is, for example, a limitation by systems tied to dedicated software-hardware combinations. In Stellar, we have multiple software partners and we have an open data structure. 
In complex, the fourth challenge was complex measurement environments, such as metal housings, a lot of metal racks, and for example, individually caged animals. In Stella, we can do group housing, and we can use these complex systems, and you'll see a few like the Phenomaster and inhalation toxicology chambers as an example of what environments that we're talking about. So what innovations and in technology in the stellar telemetry? Solution make this possible. Let's review a few of these key innovations. Onboard memory. The first innovation is the freedom it allows you to basically record to in built-in memory and the freedom to move with no data dropouts. And there's no requirement for receiver proximity, thus the animal has freedom to roam. We also implemented solid state pressure sensors at the tip of a lead, so we can have variable lead length and easy handling in the surgery, and they're virtually direct drift free. The third technology and innovation is the latest transmitter technology, extended range with unique digital addresses, so movement, exercise, social interaction in groups is not a problem anymore. And animals may even leave a room for procedures while the implant is still recording. Lastly, it's a smart implant. It has a microprocessor for protocol execution and scheduling, and it allows, therefore, autonomous operation. So now that we've told you what Stella can do, it's time to show you what it looks like. And to the existing users of legacy systems, this may come to a little bit of a shock, because here it is. Basically, what you see is, is two devices. If you think about telemetry, you need three components. An implant that records and sends the data, an antenna receiver unit that picks up the data, and finally a computer to store and analyze the data. And that is what you get. Basically, the antenna can be placed on the wall, ceiling, or in another room, and you can even carry it around. It's that small. The extended range, at least 5 meters, 15 feet, with optional antenna rays if the rooms are really, really large. And all of this, basically, only one USB connection to a computer for data transfer from the antenna receiver and actually to receive power. So although Stella is sophisticated, it's simple and economical. So what are the consequences? For those of you working in GLP environments, you'll appreciate that the entire system has only two hardware parts. So inches, if not feet, of doc documentation can go out of the window when it comes to validation. In most cases, you can keep your existing software environment. For those of you all in laboratory settings, and especially academic institutions, it's also simple, and it means a lot cheaper to buy and also to maintain. And this is one of the reasons why we believe this platform can now be more widely used in mainstream physiological monitoring, where whole animal models still make the difference when it comes to relevance and translation of scientific findings at the cell or organ level. We all know when the reviewer of this study asked a simple yet very entertaining question, so what? Is it relevant? And telemetry may provide that answer. So what can we measure with Stella? Pressure. We already mentioned the solid, stip, the solid tip pressure lead that is really small. It can be placed directly at the source in the target area, anywhere in the body of an organ, regardless whether this is a fluid environment or a cavity. This is a clear advantage over fluid-filled catheters. The solid-state technology gives better frequency response and better long-term fidelity. This may particularly be important in small rodents and also for analyzing underlying signals because you have real raw data points. In terms of biopotential, we have the usual suspects, EKG, EMG, EOG, and EEG. When it comes to temperature, core body temperature remains a key physiological parameter to gauge circadian activity, overall health of the animal, and more and more an actual key readout in situations of studying metabolism or immunological challenges such as infections leading to cooling or fever reactions in the animals. Activity is an added feature, also fully digital using the same technology we have in our smartphones, on iPads and iPods, where we turn or rotate the screen, or for the happy few, have time to play games. So what added capabilities in Stellar extend the use to more complex environments? TZ is a large global supplier of life science instrumentation in three key areas. First of all, metabolism. With our Phenomaster system, where up to 64 group house animals are monitored continuously in a metal-enclosed environmental chamber, such as shown on the left. Second, inhalation toxicology, where many animals are simultaneously exposed to a common source of particles or agents in a very crowded and restrained environment. 
And third, behavioral pharmaco uh, phenotyping, where complex paradigms and tasks are monitored in a crowded environment of detectors, cameras, gauges, and box systems. Now, none of these challenging environments can be covered with legacy telemetry. You need Stellar, and we need Stellar. So what about data recording and analysis? The readout of the Stellar is simple and open. One USB connection to a computer or laptop is all you need, and all the mobility and freedom that comes with it. The data structure is open and transparent and not tied to a particular software package. However, we have partnered with Biopack to deliver a turnkey solution that takes care of the three essential elements that Stellar Platform offers and needs, and they're shown on this slide. First, a scheduler is to set up the experiment and basically here you tell the implants which implants should be active, what to measure, when to measure, how often, and at what rate, and finally, when you want the data. It very much, much looks like a calendar, for example, that you know from Outlook, and it's exactly that easy to use. A similar partner in the GOP environment is not a port. Second, you need a display environment to scroll, review, select the data, what you want, and finally, shown on the right, and finally, you need analysis routines built in to take the hassle out of analysis and statistics and compatibility with Excel, SPSS, Origin, and other data analysis packages. All of this is taking full advantage of the flexibility and microprocessor built in Stellar. Since the microprocessor will execute the protocol, there is no need to stick around or have the computer running. You could actually take your laptop and antenna elsewhere to monitor another group of animals elsewhere in the building, read out the data, or just go back to the office and analyze. Your implants will still be recording. It's the free in freedom. So what implants do we currently offer in the Stellar line? They're shown on this slide. Depending on the animal size, typically given by their weight, we offer three sizes that differ in battery capacity for months to years of recording pleasure, depending on the intensity of use. The implants can be recovered, re-sterilized, and reused as long as the battery has a charge. And battery status is always sent along with the data to keep surprises to a minimum. We only use solid-state technology, so the leads for pressure and biopotential are either one or two standards that fit most animals, but we welcome orders for custom length as well, with little difference in cost. Let me end my presentation with a few take-home messages about Stellar before I hand back to Andy. In summary, we're showing you a new generation of telemetry implants using the latest technologies, and we think we can provide you with a new toolbox for physiological monitoring. It's an all-digital single antenna system that can be used in very complex environments and also in group housed and social housed animals. It's a very flexible measurement environment with maximum measurement scheduling, what you need, when you need it, where you need it. And finally, it is a very economical and mobile system. So with that, I'll thank you for the attention and hand back over to Andy. I'm Lou DeLacy, and I run the telemetry, telemetry core facility at the University of Michigan, uh, involving you know, 15 to 20 PIs, uh, depending upon the time of year and the funding. Over the past 15 years, we have performed over 1,500 blood pressure telemetry implants in rodents, primarily mice. What happens? There we go. Um, what we're going to handle today um, is basically these, these four general areas of, of interest. Um, uh, how do how does one or how do we ensure proper sensor placement in different sized rodents, especially for protocols where significant growth is a factor? Uh, two, how do we deal with the pressure sensor placement? and lead anchoring, uh, which I consider very important. Three, how do we deal with anchoring the implant, that's the body of the implant, in the abdomen while externalizing uh, the leads, both the electrical and or pressure? And four, how does this all together uh, ensure reliable long-term recording of ECG, body temperature activity uh, in rodent models, as well as pressure? Okay, so we'll deal with the first question first. Historically, fluid-filled catheters uh, needed to be kept as short as possible in order to maintain adequate frequency response capability of the catheter. 
with humans with a heart rate of 70 beats per minute, this was not technically difficult. With rats, the heart rates of 250 beats per minute, this became a little more difficult. And now with mice, with heart rates approaching 10 times the human rate, the distensibility and length of a fluid-filled catheter really becomes problematic. Hydraulic damping increases directly with the length of the catheter. By contrast, solid-state pressures uh, sensors can be placed at the, at the end of virtually any length lead with no loss in pressure sensing fidelity. Once the solid state, state sensor tip is within the lumen of a vessel, any extra lead length can be positioned to allow for substantial growth of the animal as well as free movement without disturbing the catheter or lead. I will show you how we secure the stellar pressure lead so that it remains fixed in the aorta of a rat. Here I'm going to play the, the video if it works. Here we go. As illustrated in this short video, the solid state design of the pressure sensor also allows for substantial manipulation looping and securing of the solid state lead that would be problematic when the fluid filled cath with fluid filled catheter systems. Here we're showing a loop knot being placed in the pressure uh, lead. For a 250 gram rat, we typically have our implants manufactured with a 15 centimeter pressure sensor leads and 12 centimeter ECG leads. However, either can be manufactured to virtually any desired length. We have implanted stellar solid state pressure sensors in the carotid, the femoral, and the aorta of rodents under conditions where the lead needed to be passed through the body wall using a trocar. I mention this now to make new note of the robustness of the solid state sensor system and report that routing the sensor to remote areas of the body is practical with suitable trocars. In this preparation, in this, I'm sorry, in this presentation, I am separately addressing the placement of the pressure sensor, the lead and tip, and the body of the stellar implant. Later in the presentation, I will show you how we stabilize the body of the implant within the abdominal closure using the ligamentous structure of the linear alba. This location allows us to route the pressure lead to virtually anywhere in the body. Today, however, we are not going to need the use of a choke off of the pressure lead because, the body, because both the body of the implant and the aorta are within the abdominal cavity. The issue to, to be addressed now is how to secure the catheter such that long-term recording in a free-ranging animal is possible without sensor displacement and loss of signal. The rationale for securing the lead applies to any other site where stability of the sensor placement is needed. So, how do we deal with the pressure sensor placement and lead anchoring. In this slide, uh, we have already uh, opened the abdomen, general anesthesia, opened the abdomen, and retracted. So after re uh, retracting the intestines and exposing the posterior wall of the abdomen, the peritoneal lining is cleared from a small section of muscle adjacent to the left iliac bifurcation. All right. In this graphic, the aorta is down the center of the screen and the iliac bifurcation is near the bottom as indicated by my moving arrow. Okay. What we are showing here is the passing of a tapered needle into the muscle mass to, mit, to permit the formation of a stable anchor. The loop engages enough, enough muscle tissue 
so that it does not pull through. Once the loop is secure, a second loop is formed through which the pressure sensor lead will be passed prior to insertion into the aorta. At this time, the implant body is resting on the chest on a sterile gauze with the eyelets facing down to the chest wall. We've got two panels here. On the left panel, we, we see highlighted with the blue circle, the loop ready to accept the, the pressure lead. Mid view is the aorta. Okay. Uh, on the uh, posterior wall of the abdomen. At this point, major blunt dissection of the aorta is done with cotton swabs creating pockets uh, just proximal to the iliac bifurcation and just distal to the renal artery. Shown here on the right panel, so we're switching to the right panel now, are two microseraphin clamps placed across the aorta at these two locations. This isolates a section of the distal aorta into which the sensor lead will be placed. We're going to go through some of the details in this graphic so you understand what's happening. In the upper right corner, well, the pressure lead, it's like a clear plastic tube, passes uh, under a retraction hook and then along and then along the uh, abdominal wall out of the field. It, <clears throat> it comes back into frame in the lower left corner over here. The lead passes through the securing loop illustrated with the, the blue circle, and is ready for insertion into the artery. So all this preliminary uh, positioning stabilizes the, uh, the sensor lead. An arteriotomy is, is made with a 25 gauge needle bent at the tip into a right angle. The bent needle tip is inserted into the aorta and the pressure sensor lead passes beneath the needle into the vessel. The lead tip is advanced until it reaches the proximal clamp, typically about 10 millimeters. The anchoring loop is tightened and the excess lead is slid back along the body wall. A small drop of uh, surgical adhesive is placed on the arteriotomy. To further stabilize the, the, uh, the, the pressure lead, we show on, in the left panel here a, a rectangular cellulose patch being placed over the lead as it enters the arteriotomy. Additional surgical adhesive is applied on the four corners uh, and to, th to the lead. Okay. That's illustrated on the left here uh, with the 32-gauge uh, uh, dispensing tip applying the adhesive, and you can just about make out the outline of the cellulose patch which is now wetted with adhesive and tissue fluid. At this point, the pressure sensor and lead are secured. The vessel clamps are removed, and we turn our attention to the body of the implant. The body of the implant is rotated into the abdomen with anchoring eyelets facing the closure. Any additional lead length is repositioned to allow free movement of the animal as well as as growth. 
They must now deal with anchoring of the implant and closing the abdomen. Okay. So, how do we deal with anchoring the implant so it is stable uh, for, for long term? The ability to manufacture the device with pressure leads of any lengths gives us flexibility to independently in secure the sensor tip and the body of the implant. We have already presented our approach to securing the tip, and we feel we can optimize implant stability by combining the abdominal closure and securing the implant uh, to, the, to the body wall. We're well, now looking at the partially closed uh, uh, abdomen, where you can see the uh, eyelets of the implant protruding through the uh, partially closed abdomen. The basic closure shown here would be the same for a variety of implant protocols with the sensor at any location. The key features are that we use interrupted suture and liberally involve the tendinous structure of the linear alba. We alternate between engaging each implant loop and the space between to fully close the abdomen. Each stitch is snug, but not so tight as to cause ischemic breakdown. For additional security, we use a touch of adhesive uh, on each knot. So, how does this approach uh, ensure a reliable long-term recording uh, of pressure, EKG, body temperature, and activity in the rodent? We think the, the idea of combining uh, independent approaches to securing the tip and the body of the implant, we substantially enhance long-term uh, uh, recording stability. So if we go back to our initial uh, uh, questions and issues, the, the wire lead versus the fluid flow catheter maximizes our flexibility in selection of pressure sensor location, and the solid state technology permits measurements at the source, okay, within the, the, the vessel or lumen of, of, uh, uh, that you want to measure the pressure. You, the use of the extra lead length allows for growth and uh, motion without uh, signal loss and independently stabilizing the sensor and the implant body enhances long-term long recording stability. Um, the flexibility of data collection and power management that Harry and Jeff speak to can be optimized uh, for recording duration or detailed uh, data uh, density. I'll leave that to you. Thank you for your attention. Andy, you can take back the controls. Thank you, Andy. Um, and thank everyone for uh, uh, joining in this webinar today. Uh, next, I, I want to discuss with you uh, the application of the stellar telemetry system for use in uh, large free-ranging animals uh, where natural behavioral activities uh, are critical to your experimental outcomes. Um, first of all, um, it's critical in cardiovascular pathophysiology, uh, we believe, to be able to study larger animals. And the first challenge in this, uh, these types of studies in, in animals such as the non-human primate um, are, are the study of these animals within a natural environment. Um, and, and secondly, we're interested in uh, assuring that the full behavioral assimilations of the non-human primates uh, are available because we think that these are essential for uh, the, the data integrity of your, uh, of your cardiovascular recording, recording parameters. Uh, but thirdly, our third challenge that we see in, in a, a telemetry study of the cardiovascular system in animals such as the non-human primate uh, are the acquiring of reproducible measurements of the cardiovascular function over very long time periods uh, using direct, uh, direct telemetry recording in animals that are, are living in their normal uh, natural environment. 
Um, lastly, we're, uh, we've begun to study now the African green or rosette monkey uh, that is an old world species that provides, uh, we believe, provides a translational model of human essential hypertension. And we'll show you some data later on that, that we think uh, is, is uh, convincing in terms of that uh, translational model and the, and the study of, of, of hypertension. So to begin with, um, I'd like to uh, speak to the point and show a short uh, video clip uh, of the vervet monkeys living in their natural environment. And you can see the challenge with these monkeys uh, uh, moving around in all different kinds of positions, moving in lots of different directions in their natural, uh, natural environment. They live in troops uh, behaviorally with, uh, uh, with, with normal troop characteristics uh, in the open environment. Uh, and and they, they provide you with a number of different uh, challenges when we begin to think about uh, uh, begin to think about telemetry and how we're going to utilize telemetry uh, under these types uh, in these types of, of, of conditions. So with that, I'd, I'd like to uh, begin to uh, uh, reiterate and go over the the way in which we're implanting the stellar catheter into the abdominal aorta um, of these uh, of these vervets. Uh, and how we're, and then and then show you some data of uh, of uh, how these uh, uh, catheters actually perform uh, within within the animal. So to begin, we uh, we isolate the abdominal area, aorta uh, between the uh, inferior um, mesenteric artery and uh, immediately below the left renal artery. Now we we make this approach that you can see shown with my uh, with the arrows through a retroperitoneal flank incision. Um, we take that approach because we don't, uh, in, in the non-human primate, we don't want to enter the peritoneal cavity. And we feel that this approach uh, greatly reduces the, uh, uh, the impact on infection. And it secures the catheter in place and holds it uh, very nicely uh, so that we, we can uh, utilize the non-human primate in its active moving environment uh, without disruption of the catheter and maintaining the patency of the, uh, uh, of, of the device, as, as Lou just talked about. So we isolate approximately 3 to 4 centimeters uh, of the uh, abdominal aorta, uh, just uh, caudad to the left renal artery and the renal vein. Uh, we then use a 5-0 Tevdec suture uh, and, and place a purse string suture that you can see uh, shown in the center of the screen here. Um, uh, into the ad adventition of, of the aorta. Uh, we place a segment of umbilical tape of both proximally and distally to our insertion site so that we can control the flow uh, at the time of catheter implantation. Uh, we then uh, um, provide about 3 to 5 cent centimeters uh, of the catheter. Uh, we insert the catheter uh, uh, very similar to the technique that, uh, that Lou indicated in, in the rat. We utilize a uh, uh, rather than a 25-gauge needle, we utilize a 16-gauge needle. And we insert that uh, catheter directly into the aorta, approximately 3 to 5 centimeters, uh, and secure it with, a, uh, 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 with the ligature of the purse string, uh, purse string suture. Once that catheter is implanted, approximately 3 to, three to 5 centimeters, uh, and after we've closed the purse string suture, we place a 1 centimeter by 1 centimeter Dacron patch uh, over the top of the uh, catheter. And again, we use uh, surgical glue or vet bond uh, on that Dacron patch to uh, um, secure and hold the catheter in place uh, on the outside of the, um, uh, of the, of the aorta. Um, using this technique, then, you can see uh, approximately uh, two, to, two, to two weeks later, you can see that the animal is fully recovered. Uh, this shows the uh, incision site for the retroperitoneal uh, approach on the left side of this particular vervet. Um, in this particular animal, we implanted the stellar uh, uh, um, device uh, subcutaneously. We've now uh, adjusted that uh, process in more recent, uh, uh, recent implants. And we're now placing this uh, stellar de device uh, between the muscle layers uh, of, the, of the animal uh, similar to the way Lou showed in the abdominal region of, of, the, uh, of the rat, where we place this stellar uh, transmitter device uh, between these muscle, muscle layers. We secure and close those mu 
muscle layers with the 2O gut suture. Uh, and the antenna is the only uh, component that is, ex uh, is placed subcutaneously for transmission uh, of the data that is received. Uh, we, do, we do utilize a loop technique similar to what uh, uh, Lou described in the abdominal approach in the rat. We loop that catheter around so that uh, when it's secured, there's plenty of play within the, uh, within the uh, solid state catheter uh, for the animals when they're moving and jumping around within their cage postoperatively after they've been returned to their natural environment uh, to maintain the patency, uh, patency of, the, uh, of the catheter. Now, with the assistance of Dr. John Descanio uh, in the Ross University School of Veter Veterinary Medicine, uh, we've obtained some ultrasonographic images of these implanted catheters uh, in um, lightly sedated uh, vervets. The yellow uh, uh, aortic walls are shown by the uh, yellow arrows. Uh, one aortic wall you see here, uh, the other aortic wall you see uh, immediately below, and uh, the um, uh, the catheter residing within the vessel lumen is shown uh, by the red arrows uh, in the uh, implanted vervet. Uh, these particular uh, images, ultrasonographic images, were obtained uh, approximately three weeks after catheter, uh, catheter implantation. Now this is a longitudinal view. If we turn this, if John uh, turns this to a, a cross-sectional view, we can see the aorta wall uh, shown by the red circle, and the catheter tip is shown uh, lodged within the aorta, as you see in the, in the center of the image uh, uh, that's taken in, in a cross-sectional view of the aorta uh, with the uh, ultrasonic uh, in image. So if we now move to a, um, uh, an image in which uh, we, we look at the video, again, here is our cross-sectional view of the aorta, which you'll see in a minute, and the catheter tip shown in the center. Uh, when we turn the video on, you can see the pulsation of the aorta, uh, and you can see the catheter tip residing uh, right in the center of the lumen uh, where the laminar flow is the greatest. Uh, we'll show this one more time for you. Uh, and you can see that there's very little movement of the catheter within the aorta, uh, which, which we, uh, we know is critical uh, to maintaining uh, hemodynamics uh, and maintaining a solid uh, um, uh, um, pressure um, measurement uh, in, in, in the animals. Uh, I think it's important for you to note how the catheter uh, remains intact. Uh, there's not a lot of flopping around of the catheter. It's not heating up against the walls, uh, and it sits uh, very nicely within the center of the evolution uh, uh, of the uh, vessel. And uh, these images were taken under uh, ketamine sedation in the animal. Uh, at about 12 milligrams per kilogram IM. Now, if we look at the longitudinal section in the same animal that we see here, uh, we'll take a, of the abdominal aorta. This is the wall of the aorta you see here. Here's the, uh, the other wall of the aorta, and the catheter is uh, lying, uh, down the, lying down the center of the aorta. Uh, it remains intact. If we watch this video now uh, in this particular animal, you can again see that the catheter is sitting very nicely in the center in the laminar flow portion of the aorta, uh, that there's not a great deal of uh, movement of the catheter uh, in and around the aorta uh, so that uh, platelet function is not disturbed, red blood cell uh, function is not disturbed, white blood cell function is not disturbed, and the catheter sits right in the, uh, very, very nicely right in the, in the center of the, of, of the, of the, of the aorta. Um, in the uh, descending aorta of, of the abdomen. So now let's uh, look at some, some data that uh, have been recorded uh, in the vervet. Um, and and uh, approximately these data were collected approximately 10 days post-surgical uh, uh, implantation in a single vervet monkey. And we're going to show the data that were recorded from the, using the recording parameters uh, of 200 hertz and we recorded, we programmed the instrument at this, uh, in this particular animal uh, to record 10 seconds every 10 minutes. The standard errors that you'll see uh, in the next slide represent the variability of these 10 second recordings every 10 minutes uh, within each hour of the, um, of, of the recording uh, in, in the conscious, uh, freely, freely moving, move, moving uh, vervet monkey. 
So we can see now over three consecutive days of recording, day one, day two, and day three are shown on the, uh, the x-axis. And the mean arterial pressure, note that this is the mean arterial pressure shown on the, uh, the ordinate or the y-axis. Uh, and we can see a nice circadian uh, uh, variation in the mean arterial pressure over the three days with the circadian pressure falling uh, as we go from the later afternoon into the early evening hours. Uh, the pressure tends to rise um, somewhere around 2 a.m., begins to increase. It actually pe peaks at about daylight time and begins to fall again uh, and reaches a nadir uh, somewhere around noon uh, in this particular animal. And one of the pieces that I want you to note in this particular animal, this animal had been previously phenotyped uh, as being hypertensive. Uh, the animal is phenotyped using forearm plethysmography under uh, ketamine uh, anesthesia, and so we particularly chose this, this specific animal to show you, to give you an example of a, 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 a vervet monkey uh, exhibiting uh, what we think is essential hypertension in this particular colony. So the normal average 24-hour pressure in this animal is running somewhere around 128 uh, millimeters of mercury uh, as mean arterial pressure. Uh, we get nice hourly variability. Uh, in the animal, and we get nice uh, uh, tight recording of the of the arterial pressures uh, uh, using a 10 seconds every 10 minute uh, recording uh, parameter uh, within within the uh, uh, within the system. Now, if we compare the heart rate to the mean arterial pressure over the same three days in this animal, we find again the circadian rhythm that we see in in uh, uh, in heart rate that that follows and mirrors the blood pressure recording. Uh, in this hypertensive animal, heart rates in the uh, non-human primate in the African green monkey generally range from about 115 to 145 uh, beats per minute. Uh, and we show this uh, uh, nighttime cycling uh, that, that we see in, in these animals uh, where, where heart rate begins to rise somewhere around 1 or 2 a.m. in each of the three days. It peaks uh, just like blood pressure at about the time of daybreak. Uh, as the uh, uh, day moves on, uh, heart rate begins to fall, uh, coincident with uh, the mean arterial pressure. Uh, the next slide shows you a comparison between heart rate and body temperature. And uh, the body temperature is, is shown, uh, again, showing a nice circadian uh, variation in body temperature with the nadir of body temperature somewhere around 34.7. Um, uh, degrees Celsius that occurs at about midnight. And just uh, coincident with heart rate, as heart rate begins to rise at 1 or 2 a.m., uh, the body temperature begins to rise as an index of metabolic function. And we know there's a nice tight correlation between heart rate uh, and metabolic rate. And this is uh, corroborated in these monkeys with the, the stellar system uh, as we compare uh, core body temperature to, uh, uh, to the heart rate, heart rate parameters. Uh, again, the core body temperature measurements at 10 seconds every, uh, every hour, um, uh, every 10 minutes uh, uh, in the 24-hour cycle uh, gives you a nice uh, uh, low, small standard error uh, of the mean in the 24-hour cycling uh, with, the, uh, with these particular measurements. Now, at present, we're currently um, uh, in the process of maintaining a long-term recording uh, in two separate uh, vervets, uh, free-ranging vervets, using the stellar telemetry system that Harm so uh, that Harry so clearly showed in the uh, the initial talk, um, these particular animals were instrumented uh, March 10th and 11th, and we began the recording date on March 21st uh, uh, of this uh, this this spring. Uh, we're recording in these animals at 12 a.m. and 12 p.m. for 15 seconds every 12 hours, and the recording is ongoing as we speak uh, every single day uh, through July 15th. And as, as Harry uh, pointed out, the, the computer has been removed from the, uh, uh, from the animals. We're not downloading the, the data. All the data is being stored on the microchip, on the stellar microchip, with, within the free-ranging, free-moving monkeys. Uh, we will then go back in July. We will download those data. Uh, to the uh, um, uh, receiver system, we'll download those data, and we'll uh, then begin our analysis of the collected data from the microchip 
uh, that will give us approximately three continuous months of daily recording uh, twice per day at 15 seconds uh, every hour to give us a, a clear and accurate picture of the uh, blood pressure in these free-ranging um, um, vervet monkeys that are living within their troops uh, within, the, uh, within, within the colony. So to summarize then, um, the vervet uh, or the African green monkey provides a, a unique old world non-human primate model for conducting uh, research studies using the tele, uh, stellar telemetry system. Uh, uh, the, this non-human primate or this primate develops essential hypertension very similar or near to its evolutionary co uh, cousin, H. sapiens. And with this uh, recording technology, we now have the unique ability to begin uh, translational studies of cardiovascular disease in a normal behavioral uh, environment for the uh, 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 Burvet. Well, we're going to be able to apply these, uh, uh, these data to humans uh, across the, the globe. The Burvet genome has been fully sequenced. Um, and uh, we can now utilize this new technology to connect genetic mechanisms to the long-term recorded phenotype uh, within this species and utilize it as a translational model of human uh, essential uh, hypertension. To summarize then, uh, telemetry of freely moving uh, behaviorally acclimatized non-human primates requires a unique data collection uh, system and transmission properties that we think the stellar telemetry system uh, provides us that, uh, that opportunity uh, to be able to do this in, in the non-human primate. This te te technology is clear and essential for overcoming these challenges. Implantation of the, the stellar catheter in the freely moving Varev monkey uh, records consistent uh, blood pressures, heart rates, and core body temperatures uh, within a 24-hour uh, period with precision and accuracy. And the Vervet uh, Monkey Animal Model uh, plus the, the stellar technology gives us this translational species uh, ability to study the long-term uh, control and pathophysiology of cardiovascular function and hypertension uh, over uh, extended period time, periods of time. So with that, I'll turn it back to Andy, and we'll uh, utilize this uh, uh, time for a question and answer se uh, session. Andy, back to you. Thanks, Jeff. Um, thanks for the excellent presentation and very in in interesting information. And, and actually, as we have transitioned into the Q and A, um, I figured I'd actually um, bring the other speakers online, but start with you because I have one here. Um, one of our audience members is, is uh, would like you to comment further on the surgical approach that you covered in your presentation. And basically, the question is, is do you see this as an absolute requirement? And, and in particular, what makes that surgical approach particularly advantageous in, uh, in the vervet monkey, that, in the model that you're doing? So, um, Yeah, I, you know, I, I, it's, it's a very good question. I have, I have not yet used an abdominal approach to, uh, uh, to insert these catheters. Uh, the, the non-human primate uh, is, is quite different from, you know, rodent models, rats and mice, and, and other, other species, as they're, they're significantly more susceptible to post-surgical trauma and post-surgical infection. So um, the attending veterinarian uh, from Ross uh, that I work very closely with in this colony, uh, she and I have... Uh, have utilized this retroperitoneal approach, uh, first of all, because it's very quick and easy to get to the abdominal aorta. Uh, it doesn't invade the peritoneum, so we don't have to worry about peritonitis or the uh, uh, um, uh, obtaining abdominal peritoneal type infections. And it exposes the aorta very simply, and by putting the, uh, the transmitter, the stellar transmitter, is turning it between the muscle layers of the strap muscles of the back, uh, we can secure the, cath the uh, transmitter very, very nicely uh, such that in the non-human primate where there's lots of activity and lots of movement uh, post-operatively and post-surgically, uh, we think it secures the, uh, the system very, very nicely. So we haven't used an abdominal approach. We've been very, very successful uh, with the retroperitoneal approach. And uh, that, those are the, the, the primary reasons that we use that approach. Thank you. That, that's great feedback, Jeff. Appreciate that. Um, so, yeah, we do have um, Harry and Lou online as well, I believe now. Um, gentlemen, are you with us? Yes. Uh, yes I am. Excellent. Perfect. So, uh, first question, and I think this would be best uh, maybe addressed by uh, 
uh, both Lou and Harry. Uh, it basically is, is it easier to implant a solid state sensor than a regular fluid filled catheter? And this came in during your section, Lou. So um, perhaps you could provide some uh, some background based on your experience, and then Harry, if you've got some additional points, maybe you can uh, chime in as well. Well, I, I guess the the key feature here is that we're talking about a solid state lead rather than a fluid filled catheter. Okay, mm -hmm. and so the basic um, the basic procedure for uh, uh, isolating the vessel and insertion is pretty much the same. Um, and I guess the key feature I would speak to for the solid state is that it's more forgiving. So, you know, you try and you miss, uh, you get to try again without having uh, compromised the, the gel or the fluid in the tip of the catheter. So you can get away with bumping the sides of the wall without dislodging the fluid. And uh, that's, uh, you know, a, a, a significant advantage. Placing the actual insertion is about the same, but you you um, you get to try again, and I guess that makes it uh, overall easier. Okay, no, well, that's great feedback, Harry. Do you have uh, any additional points? Uh, you know, is it easier to implant a solid state sensor than a regular fluid filled, or or you know, what would just be the comparison of the process, maybe, from a surgical perspective? No, I, I think I think Lee Lou covered covered the basis there. I think I, the, the ability to just grab and hold it. Uh, using different surgical tools and, and and like I said, you know, put a loop in it if you have a little bit too much length, for example. Those are the kind of flexibilities in the solid state okay. uh, lead that you have. Excellent. Okay. Uh, well, and then, you know what, another one for you, Harry, then. Um, specific question came in from the audience about the capacity of the implant. It, you know, during the presentation, it's been stressed that data is actually stored on the um, implant device and then at the scientist's convenience transferred and collected and then moved on for data analysis. Um, so what, what are the technical considerations there for memory capacity? Well, principally the implant comes with, with a, a very large amount of memory, so up to a gigabyte of memory. Uh, so it takes quite some time and, and, and measurements to actually reach that. And what we have is we provide tools basically to let you calculate uh, how long you could, could potentially wait until you download the data. Uh, you don't really have to. In, in terms of, of course, you know, if you don't download, it may save a little bit of battery life. But principally, uh, it doesn't. Have, you don't have to wait three months. <laughs> okay. Uh, three months is an example that Jeff took because he's basically these these animals, I guess, far away from his lab in, in on an island. In the mm -hmm. uh, for those people that have the roads basically almost in the same building, uh, you can you can go to like every half hour or every hour or once a day. Uh, it's very rare that you would reach the limit of the internal memory, uh, given the protocols that we typically use. Perfect. Given, given that, I'm, given that, Andy, I might chime in here. Yeah. Even in our, even in our three-month recording, we've uh, we've anticipated that we're only going to utilize about forty percent uh, of the total battery life uh, over the three-month recording. So um, we're, we're not even we're not even beginning to compromise the. Uh, the implant, even with this very long-term recording uh, that's going on at a, at a very distant site. Okay. And perhaps also it's important to know that you know if you if you reach this at this point, the data are not lost. It will just stop recording until you've basically emptied the memory. Is, is it fair to um, uh, to say that you could also modify the the pattern of uh, data sampling? So, for example, if you wanted to do some high-density sampling uh, for a response to a drug, you could switch it over to high-density sampling, do your injection, and follow it for an hour or two, and then switch it back. Is that is that a capability that um, is programmable? Absolutely. So within that scheduler, basically, you can program sessions in which you specify what leads to look at. For example, you say, okay, pressure I want to do four times a day, but I want an EKG once a day. And an EKG probably at a, at a, at a higher data rate, like one kilohertz, for, uh, for example, than you would do pressure where 200 hertz is the same. So that flexibility in programming as well as in data density and, and recording frequency 
is absolutely there. And you can schedule that in advance and then the, basically the implant, the microprocessor, will take will take it from there and, and just execute. Um, if you want the data in between, um, you just have to schedule, you know, in, in the periods where you're not recording, for example, you can schedule a download, but in that case you do need to have the, uh, the receiver system in the vicinity. Okay. Yeah, and and I, and I maybe actually while we're on the implant or the or the topic of the of the implant features, let's shift gears here to address another question uh, about sterilization. So um, again, this came in around your uh, lecture slides, Lou, but I think it really applies to everybody. You know, everybody in the group call here. What are the you know what is the experience and how you guys are going about sterilizing? Um, and reusing the Stellar implant in your applications, and then Harry, maybe you can share some, you know, particular technical guidance that that TSC suggests scientists follow. Yeah, I I, I think I think Jeff made a, a critical point here. Uh, if you're playing with rats the way I am, um, sterility is a very different issue than um, in uh, one of these primates. Um, you know. We uh, trade on the robust nature of those implants, and we can, you know, gently rin rinse them, flush them with some enzymatic detergent, uh, disinfect with glutaraldehyde, and basically reimplant. Um, you know, hold my feet to the fire for is that completely 100% sterile? Probably not. Um, if you want to go 100% sterile, you're going to probably want to go gas sterilization. Uh, I don't have experience at that level because I have the luxury of using the rat. Uh, I think Jeff said that he used gas. Was that true, Jeff? Yes. We, uh, we've not done cold sterilization of the instrument in the non-human primate. We've done everything with gas sterilization and ethylene oxide. Um, you know, it is important for the users to know that uh, autoclaving is not recommended by uh, TSC or Stellar. Um, and uh, so, but gas sterilization, we've, we have never had a systemic in infection in any of the animals that we've implanted these, uh, these devices. Very good. Harry, is there anything else um, uh, that you'd like to add to that? Or if they well, covered it? Uh, yeah, well, more or less. I, th I think, uh, you know, the cleaning, I guess the, the, the essence of cleaning, uh, for example, if you reuse it in the, in the different animals, obviously you have to get rid of the protein uh, that may be on the outside. So typically what every lab usually uses is terpazine solutions for that, mm -hmm. for all the rinsing. And then basically for the sterilization, that's more the cleaning uh, part. And then you, in order to sterilize, you can use a cold sterilization like an overnight soak in 2% of glutaraldehyde uh, with a lot of rinsing afterwards uh, with uh, with sterile water uh, and before you then uh, basically repackage them for example in, in sterile packaging okay, in a laminar flow wood for example um, or the alternative is and, and that's more critical when you go to to uh, non-human primates is to use gas sterilization perfect very good gentlemen well in the interest of time I'm going to suggest we close off uh, the Q&A at this point we've had a few other questions come in as usual but um, you know the way that we do that is is we ask that uh, you know our group um, put our heads together, address questions, and then that'll be provided as a, a, you know accessible material uh, on InsideScientific.com. So um, let me officially thank our speakers today, uh, Dr. Harry Knott, uh, Dr. Jeff Osborne, and Dr. Lou DeLacy. Uh, gentlemen, it's been a pleasure having you. Thanks for your contributions to this uh, session. And uh, to everyone in the audience uh, with us still, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Uh, again, this was session two as part of Biotelemetry for the Life Sciences uh, web series. There will be additional sessions uh, coming soon in this agenda, and we'll obviously be keeping you all informed of um, the next presentations to come. So again, big thanks, gentlemen. Uh, and um, and uh, it's been a pleasure working with you. So have a great day, everybody. Thank you, Andy. All right. Thank you. You're very welcome.